welcome to the Committee of Public Property and Public Works. Uh, we are now in session, and I want to recognize that a quorum is present to my left, Councilman Greenlee, Councilman Jones to my right, Councilman O. We will hear several bills, and I appreciate everybody's time who have come in and taken out a part of their day to come here and testify in favor or uh, support and wanted to give their public uh, opinions on some of the bills that we have here today. Kirk, Clerk, would you please read the titles of the bills? Bill number 190062, authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to acquire fee, simple title, or a lesser real estate interest to all or a portion of a parcel or parcels of land, together with the improvements thereon in and about the area bounded by Trenton Avenue, East Auburn Street, Tulip Street, and East Rush Street, and Bill number 190099, amending Chapter 16300 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Maintenance and Supervision by adding a new section requiring that all city buildings and facilities install and maintain life-sustaining medical equipment, including automated external defibrillators and advanced first aid kits, and requiring the installation of automated external defibrillators in connection with capital projects, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, and for the record, I uh, want to be reflected that bill number 190120 will be held for this hearing and will be at the call of the chair. Is there anyone from the administration here to testify on bill number 190062? Good morning. Good morning. And if you state your name for the record, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aperna Palantina. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Parks and Recreation. Good morning, Chairman Heenan and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Aperna Palantino, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Capital Infrastructure and Natural Lands Management for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill Number 190062, sponsored by Councilman Squilla, which authorizes the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to acquire parcels of land, together with the improvements thereon, in and about the area bounded by Trenton Avenue, East Auburn Street, Tulip Street, and East Rush Street under certain terms and conditions. The sites included in this area are 2254 to 56 Auburn Street, 2255 through 57 Rush Street, 2263 to 67 East Rush Street, and 2830 to 34 Tulip Street. These parcels are adjacent to the existing Trenton and Auburn playground. This ordinance will enable the City of Philadelphia to acquire the parcels from the Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority at a nominal fee. Once the transfer has been completed, environmental studies will be performed at the site and property will be incorporated into the playground and be included in round one of the Rebuilding Community Infrastructure Program. Capital improvements to the site will include a new play area, spray area, court resurfacing, lighting, and other furnishings. The Department of Parks and Recreation supports this measure and accordingly, I respectfully request that City Council approve Bill Number 190062. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, is, is there anyone on the committee that wishes to ask any questions on bill number 190062? Is there anyone else here today, this morning, that wishes to testify on bill number 190062? Being none, thank you so much for your thank testimony. Thank you. Have a good day. We will now hear any testimony from the administration on bill number 190099. Good morning. You may state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barry Scott. I'm the Deputy Director of Finance for Risk Management. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Heenan and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Barry Scott. I'm Director of fin uh, Deputy Director of Finance for Risk Management in the Office of the Director of Finance. I'm here to testify on Bill 190099. Uh, with me is Tom McDade, uh, who is the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Department of Public Property. We've reviewed Bill 
190099, which proposes to amend the Philadelphia Code to have the Department of Public Property supply, maintain, and supervise the installation of automatic external defibrillators and first aid kits throughout city facilities. While we agree that AEDs and first aid kits are important to the safety of our community, we want to bring to light existing programs which regulate these safety measures. The City of Philadelphia's Risk Management Division already oversees a similar directive. In July of 2017, Risk Management updated the City's guidance document and issued the Safety Directive Number P10. This directive brings a uniformity for all individual city departments to supply and maintain AED equipment to their respective buildings by directing the following. The appointment of an AED program administrators, development of a response plan, mandating a posted list of trained responders and their locations and phone numbers near the AEDs, determines the components necessary to have AED response present within three minutes, purchases AEDs, maintains a log of AEDs, the make and model number, serial number, facility address located in the facility and the location in the facility, maintains AED inspections and sends routine documentation to the departmental safety officer. Each city department is responsible for its own purchasing installation, maintenance, and inspection of their equipment under the program established by risk management. Risk also holds biannual training for safety officers in each department on the use of the equipment, and this training certification is active for two years. The city department must provide training for its staff of responders. DPP maintains properties that include the quadplex, city hall, the municipal service building, the criminal justice center, and the one parkway building, police, fire, fleet, and LNI. DPP does not have any access to maintain libraries, health centers, prisons, parks and recreation centers, and other public buildings. Risk management works closely with the Department of Public Property and other city departments in helping fully comply with the directive's standard operating procedures. DPP advises on on-site specific location issues. However, the individual maintenance of all facilities, including equipment, is left up to those individual departments. We maintain an updated list of the locations of the AEDs in city buildings. Regarding first aid kits, they are maintained on site throughout city buildings, such as in recreation centers, libraries, and other public buildings. We also ensure that trauma kits, which contain first aid kits, are located in the quadplex. These trauma kits are for high uh, level emergencies, such as a mass shooting incident. As a directive through risk management already exists for the maintenance of AEDs, the language included in this bill is duplicative. As stated, individual city departments purchase, maintain, and inspect AEDs housed in their, represent, or their respective buildings, and the oversight for the program is relegated to risk management. Thanks for your consideration, and I'll respond to questions. Hi, Mr. Scott, thank you for your testimony. Um, and as the prime sponsor of this uh, legislation, I just wanted to uh, make a, a quick note on uh, the origin of this and how we got to where we are and how I started. So um, I have two kids of my own, and you know they you know play in the playgrounds just like most kids. They, enjoy you know the sport activities and the great robust programming that we have in our parks and recreation department and you know you always one always wants to be uh, you know wants to feel safe right when they go to a playground uh, and, and safety can come at, at a multitude of levels right and you know I think through our capital department with our parks and recreation and our rebuild you know we're trying to make our parks more accessible more safe more um, ergonomically, you know, designed where, you know, people from all generations come in one place and feel safe. Uh, one thing they shouldn't have to uh, 
not feel safe is not having uh, a, a kind of response in, in, in a cardiac arrest or, or some other uh, first aid issue until our professional EMSs, you know, arrive on site. On site. Uh, so uh, with that, you know, my kids, you know, were you know, at a, a sporting event and, you know, one of uh, the players on, on the other team uh, has a, <clears throat> a, a, a congenital a heart issue. The kid collapses, two parents who are trained jump over the fence and attend to this child at a very young age and saved his life, right? Saved this young child's life. So that had me thinking that, well, you know what, maybe we should have AEDs at every rec center. And then I thought, all right, well, this is the city of Philadelphia, right? We uh, are the city of first. We are, you know, with the, my colleagues, uh, you know, creativity, health, and need for uh, progressive policies. You know, we are passing a whole lot of things, so from earned sick pay to uh, fair work week to a lot of things that are, are making our city the first and the best and the proudest of, of what we do. And our buildings are public access, our buildings uh, provide social services, our buildings are um, open, um, you know, in some cases six days a week. And we want to ensure that people feel safe because the general public is using it and God forbid, you know, in addition to, you know, somebody who's providing that service on site will also be in the need of, of, of some sort of response. Uh, so with uh, poor little TJ having this issue, and by the way, he has had a, a positive outcome, mm -hmm. right? He, uh, those two adults that were trained saved his life, rode with them the entire way, and is now a, a happy kid with a condition, right, that he has to deal with, but he's a happy kid that's, uh, you know, in, in school and, and playing sports. But it made me wonder that, all right, we could do more. How do we train people? And some of the folks that are here to testify are my partners in a program that we called ACT Now. And ACT Now, A-C-T Now, is the, the actual action of uh, a good Samaritan taking uh, control of the situation and performing CPR until EMS arrives. Of course, mm -hmm. you call 911, EMS uh, is in route. For those three, four minutes, or three, four, five minutes until EMS arrives, it's critical that something happens, right, for the, the, the outcome uh, of uh, the individual. So I, we put this program together. We have uh, some of our partners here that are fantastic. We've trained over a thousand people in my district alone. A thousand people were trained, certified, CPR. We modified it with our partners, training people who do not get certifications but are introduced to CPR and how to administer the AEDs as those who are certified, over a thousand in my district, right, they are also trained in AED, Stop the Bleed, working with, again, cities, EMS, their Community Risk Reduction Department, and they do an incredible job. And, you know, it's a part of the public outreach, just as we have for um, some of our uh, fire reduction uh, efforts that we do. And as a city knocking on doors, talking to communities, and putting in smoke detectors in houses, and what you know, what how you should you know have fire safety applying to to your own residents and or businesses. So we're doing the same thing here in life safety, uh, in, in 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 health, in, in the health uh, kind of venue. I've been in the schools, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. We have introduced CPR and AED to. 35, approximately 3,500 kids. We've, I've brought them with our partners, and you'll hear from some of them today, to our community groups in, 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 in responding and having the confidence to respond and knowing how to operate an AED and what it is and how it is, but more importantly, you know, where one is accessible. <coughs> um, so, you know, the statistics are staggering with 85% of, um, 
of, of a positive outcome if there's an AED within three minutes of a uh, of an of an incident. I'm going to call it. Where right, there's an incident and there's an AED near, and one thing we can control is our own facilities in the, in the city of Philadelphia. Things that we we can control in some cases our economy, right? When it, when it comes to the city of Philadelphia, we can we're also in a, a, a position to control some of our our policies. Now, I was talking with somebody. And this is uh, I'm going to digress a little bit just to give you a little background. Then um, I-95, the reconstruction of I-95. All right. So you, we talk about a directive from July 2017. We were 2019. Uh, not sure who's all trained, who's respond, who, you know, we have enough AEDs, are they up-to-date AEDs, or do they have another batteries, or are they AEDs that are, are bilingual, All right? But I-95, uh, 2005, 2006, PennDOT was talking about the reconstruction of, of, of I-95 in the city of Philadelphia, and I think it's gonna go on for until 2030, right? So directives are great. We have a lot of think tanks, we have a lot of people, but they're good. City of Philadelphia is a do tank. All right, and what I want to do is to be in a position to save lives when, uh, if an incident does occur. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of opportunities in front of us when we're rebuilding our parks and recreations and, and libraries. And as, you know, they're being rebuilt and we have all these ribbon cuttings and we have more robust programs because population in the city of Philadelphia is growing. It is growing, it's in, in, it's in our neighborhoods. We have our public, our public facilities are strategically placed to service the citizens of Philadelphia. So it is uh, important that they feel safe as they use the, our facilities <coughs> and or, uh, are near our facilities. So uh, that is the genesis of where this piece of policy and legislation uh, it came from, and it is my hopes that you know, positive as AEDs can bring on positive outcomes. I think this legislation will do the same. Uh, so I appreciate your, your time coming here. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Greenley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very quickly, uh, Mr. Scott, just just want to touch on your one of your last statements here. You say, as the directive through risk management already exists, the language is duplicative. Is it really because isn't an ordinance more permanent than a directive? Um, you are certainly more experienced in ordinances than I ever will be. Um, <laughs> however, um, what what for us, we are looking to make sure that things are, are operating continuously. And so what the directive does is enables us to move from the idea of public access to fibrillation in our facilities into realizing a reasonably short time period between when an event occurs and how people can respond to it. So, and as residents of one of, one of our city buildings, um, you know that there's a lot of things going on in our facilities. Right. And in order to keep our equipment maintained appropriately, to figure out how and what's going to happen if there is an event, where do people call? How do they let people know that in room 472, someone is having an event and we need an AED? And so the, process, so the directive helps to set up processes to help ensure that the AED can appropriately be accessed when needed and delivered to the spot where now, it's most needed. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I'm not I'm done. disputing any of that. Right. I, I guess my point is it, that doesn't really make the directive and the bill duplicative because an ordin a, a directive can change, and I'm not saying the next administration won't change it, right. but it could be changed. The only way this could be changed is if another council uh, introduced a bill and passed it and, you know, the, mayor, the future mayor signs it. I, well, I guess what I'm saying is this is more permanent, in our opinion, I think, than, say, a directive is. So I, I don't see it as really duplicative. I'm not saying that 
directive is wrong. Right. I'm just saying that it's, it, to me, it carries more of the force of law than, than yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't see why there should, and you didn't really say you oppose this, you know, I, from what I heard. But I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't see the problem in putting in an ordinance to make this regulation permanent. That's all I'm getting at. I, I understand. Um, I mean, part for me of, you know, our rationale, um, not being legislators, we're looking to set up the process that folks can utilize. Yeah. And we also want something which is relatively easy to update as changes occur in the field. And so the directive is what we have access to, and the directive is how yeah. our de city departments are used to hearing information about health and safety matters um, about their jobs. Okay. I, I guess I'm just saying I, I don't see where this, where this ordinance interferes with that. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. But okay. All right. We'll, we'll go back and forth. Well, as, Chairman, thank you. Yeah, as, as structured, it takes, it puts a responsibility on the Department of Public Property, which has not really been involved in this in any significant way and does not have all of the resources necessary to carry out fully the mandates in the ordinance. Yeah, right. uh, just Councilman Jones. Mr. Chairman, first of all, um, you, sh you should be applauded for taking the extra step to try to assure safety in public buildings and rec centers. That is amazing. Um, but when I hear this kind of response, it reminds me, and it's akin to when I asked parking garages to include cameras. And what was the problem there? They were risk averse. They said, well, Jones, what happens if we get sued because the camera was out? Or what happens if uh, we, we are held responsible for things we don't know where things are. That's like saying to me that we shouldn't have fire extinguishers down the hallway because everybody doesn't know where they are. Well, thank God some people on the floor may know where they are and in an emergency can be counted on to go get a operating fire to, uh, extinguisher. I'm sure if I walked around these hallways, some of them have tags that have expired, may still work, but aren't up to you know, the Freon level or whatever it is, but thank God they are there. Um, similar, I, I, I wonder if Hank gathers, or, or one of those kids that you know, suddenly caught a heart attack playing the sport they loved, we don't know if a defibrillator would have been closer that we might have saved a life. So if we are wrong a little bit, if we are off a little bit on procedure, if we error but happen to save one life, this is worth it. Uh, and I just want us not to, um, the, the imperfect should not be the enemy of the good. Uh, and this is good, Mr. Chairman, and so I appreciate it and I'll be voting for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Dell. Oh, thank you very much. I I do understand your explanation. I do very much appreciate it. It doesn't seem like it's a conflict to me. It sounds like the Department of Public Property has a directive to try to reach this goal already. Um, and uh, what is happening is that the, um, the directive is kind of internal to the department and now there will be a city ordinance, a law, that, uh, that will be um, passed if this comes out of committee uh, and is passed by council and then it becomes part of the, the law of Philadelphia and we do have oversight. We also um, have a responsibility of appropriations to ensure that you're well equipped. Uh, and, and I think um, there is a difference between a directive and a law, but I, I don't see the the, the conflict, at least I, I don't see a conflict. I think the ordinance takes it to another level of a, a broader responsibility um, 
then a department or administrative di directive. It is now something that has been passed into law and is something that we, we enforce. I'm, I'm just kind of explaining why I'm supporting this um, and, and, and why it wasn't really clear on what the distinction is exactly when it comes to saving lives uh, in this circumstance. It sounds like what we're doing is not something you oppose. That's absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. Um, the, the, the goal of uh, public access to fibrillation and making available health and safety equipment is what um, the mission of risk management is all about. And so this is something that, you know, risk has been involved in for a number of years and that, and we've worked hard to try to get the city to where we believe it needs to be. Um, and so it's the, 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 you know, because they're, you know, this is an area that we have worked in for a number of years, we, um, we have, we will put in place a system which I believe moves us closer to that goal. That goal which I hear, uh, Mr. Chair, you have uh, enunciated as your vision and, and the committee has supported. And I just want to make sure that all of the components that get us actually across that goal line are met. That was the structure, that's the rationale behind our directive. Our goal of saving the lives of our citizens is the same. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your response today. And, well, I'm not finished. <laughs> but I know you're just up here to, uh, um, you're not, you are in support of the spirit of, of and, and the intent of the, of the legislation. And, you know, I, I think we all look forward to continue to work with it, with you in making sure that our policies um, reflect legislation or legislation complements policies that uh, may be in place uh, but not implemented yet. Um, you know, one of the frustrations that I have with working for a government entity is the, um, the, the forward progress in incremental steps, right? It, and it, that is created by checks and balances, which I, I totally agree with. Uh, but when we do have policies in place, so the legislative branch will pass an ordinance, becomes law, and you know, hopefully, that council person or council members, uh, as we, you know, work together to create a, a bill, <clears throat> have been working together, and you know, and I think we've, um, I've been working with public property f for a little bit just just on, on on this, and you know, because I always try to include as many people. Uh, stakeholders as possible, mm -hmm. right? Because we want to get it right. Um, but I think we have it right here. And uh, if there are more conversations on on, on this policy uh, before it's finally vote voted on on the floor, you know, assuming it, the members of this committee sees that it should advance, uh, and that is my intent, uh, then we should continue to have these conversations because. The directive in 2007 and 2019, you know, the health department has, you know, done tremendous work with smoking, smoking sensation, public property. I'm glad you mentioned public property because they are not responsible for everything in, in the city of Philadelphia. You mentioned, you know, having different departments, you know, being responsible for, you know, for their own, their own department and their own purchases. You know, we. We should be speaking with the finance department and, and, and talking about bulk purchase of of defibrillators instead of having one department buy, you know, uh, a few defibrillators or this department buying a few more. We should consider bulk purchasing, uh, get a little more bang on our uh, or large quantities for our, our purchases. But when it when it comes to duplicate policies. And my responsibility here is to make sure that we all work together, we pass sound and practical initiatives 
all right, in legislation that helps move our city forward, helps keeps us safe, helps protect them, and is in the city's best interest uh, for whatever it is for whatever issue it is. But if we don't have certain items in place, and it's not duplicate, right? If we don't have uh, a, a, you know, if it's something's in a policy form and it's not actually something that's being carried out, then it's not necessarily a duplicative, you know, type of uh, situation. So uh, I'd rather have a overlapping policy and same goals and, and agenda because I know we do share that. And, and I appreciate you coming here today in, in, in sharing that, um, you know, because, you know, when we, when we launched, you know, the program with all our partners, uh, including our Philadelphia Fire Department um, in, their, in their risk reduction, uh, we launched it at a school, right? We launched it at a, at a high school. And there were over 100 kids. It was one of their CTE programs. So you know, there's a lot of good things that, that, that cities already taken place with and, and partners with our schools and multiple, uh, multiple um, branches of government here. So uh, we want to work together moving forward on this and, and try to figure out a way, as the councilman said, I loved how he uh, put it, in, imperfect. In, in, imperfect, imperfect. Not having yeah, never the quote, perfect, right? so, something per imperfect, and in, in, with, with good, with good, with imperfect implementation, with a, with a good policy, uh, in, in, in that vein, I think. So uh, I think we're in the right wheelhouse, right? So um, I'm going to say that City of Philadelphia, we we want to we want to add. Uh, this is our Bryce Harper. All right, in the uh, in the health department, all right, when it when it comes to uh, ensuring less risk uh, in a, in a responsible way that minimizes its exposure, uh, but has a good, but 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 has a very good a good outcome on, on a policy. All right, so we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. If it, Thank if it's you. Okay with you. Thank you. I yeah. I do. I think the. Perfect is the enemy of the good, which is what some people say about what what I'm trying to do sometimes. But what um, you know, we have developed, we have implemented, we have continued to improve, and we have continued to monitor our program of distribution of AEDs throughout the city and supporting the various departments that carry that out in terms of procurement. Of course, the procurement of AEDs is done through the city's procurement department, looking to get the best value for the product. So we are doing things to make sure that when we do purchase AEDs by whatever department, we are doing that in a way that buys the citizen the tax dollar's best value in order to provide this equipment. That equipment then gets collaboratively installed with the department and training that's provided to those people who are responsible for the use of the AED, the administrators who are responsible for making sure that it gets inspected, the folks, the administrators and facility coordinators who are responsible for making sure that it is maintained, the medical director who is responsible for overseeing that whole AED program. All of those elements are elements that the city has already put in place and are operating and have been for more than a decade. And so the, to characterize that, you know, we're not there, I don't know that that's an accurate characterization. And to quote Councilman Jones, I don't want to have the perfect be the enemy of the good. We are working toward having a larger distribution and a larger availability. And as resources permit, we have expanded. And so, and we've been working with a number of the community partners who you have named and have brought to the plate as well in order to achieve this vision for our city. Good. We'll get there. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it.
Thank Is you. Is there anyone else here have any questions uh, for Mr. Scott? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, committee. Clerk, would you read call out, uh, those who were here to testify on bill number 190-099? Darren Sudman, Simon's Heart, Rachel Moyer, Dr. Ben Abella, and Marcus Owens. While the witnesses are uh, approaching, I just want to state for the record that uh, Mr. Sullivan and the Simons Fund has been uh, an incredible partner for the Life Safety Program Act now that are, is in our schools that are training thousands of people. Um, it seems like it, it's going to be growing and our collaborative is uh, top notch. So Darren, I appreciate your um, interest in this and your participation in actually, you know, speaking with the community and training the community and, and saving lives. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, as you consider an amendment to place AEDs in all facilities, but most importantly for me, youth-related facilities. Uh, I'm happy to be back here before this body. I was here on October 25th. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Darren Sudman. I'm from Simon's Heart. I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO. I'm happy to be back here uh, before this body. I was here on October 25th, which is the day that you formally recognized and welcomed Gritty into our city. Uh, it also happened to be the day that you declared Cardiac Health Awareness Day. And uh, my organization uh, works hard in Philadelphia and the surrounding areas to raise awareness about sudden cardiac arrest and death in kids in memory of my son, Simon. And I'm uh, glad to be joined by uh, Dr. Abella, Marcus Owen, Rachel Moyer, uh, Marcus and Rachel, you'll also hear from, uh, have also lost family members and uh, have been advocating for quite some time. It's important to, to pass a law that requires the presence of AED devices in youth-related facilities, but it's also important for that legislation to contain a cardiac emergency response plan requirement. And I think that's what we just heard uh, from the previous witness. In, in my world, a directive would be a cardiac emergency response plan. And I think a good parallel is that I'm really excited when schools tell me they have a cardiac emergency response plan. That means that they are engaged in preventing sudden cardiac arrest. But I'd be really happy if the state or the Board of Education passed a law requiring schools to have a cardiac emergency response plan so it wouldn't be optional. Because what we don't want when there is cardiac arrest is uh, panic. Uh, and we don't want to find out that an AED device was present, but it was locked in an office and inaccessible. It's peculiar that this even needs to be discussed here today and that we need to legislate a solution uh, because I imagine that many of you have these in your car and these in your home. And I don't know why we would need fire extinguishers because we can simply call 911 and wait for the professionals to show up. And many of us certainly can call AAA or our dealer's uh, roadside assistance to get our car started again. Um, but the reality is, is that the AED is even more important and more critical than jumper cables and fire extinguishers because it's the only tool that can save someone in cardiac arrest. The only tool. So if someone from roadside assistance shows up, or the fire department, they'll have cables, they'll probably have a fire extinguisher, but they also have other tools at their disposal that they can use to fix our problem. But the truth is, is once the first responders show up to a cardiac arrest scene, they are gonna have an AED device, and that's what they're gonna use. They're gonna turn on the AED device and probably hear the same things that we will hear if we turn it on. Remove clothing from patient's chest peel away the liners and apply the pads, assessing patient's heart rhythm, shock advised or shock not advised. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Time is of the essence when there's a cardiac arrest. We have three minutes to deploy the AED. And for every minute after that, that we don't put the pads on someone's chest, chance of survival drops by 10%. I'm gonna close with a story. 
Three weeks ago, we donated an AED device to St. Monica School. It's part of a program that we have with the Philadelphia Flyers called the Overtime Challenge. Every time the Flyers go into sudden death overtime, we donate an AED to a local youth facility. I brought these two devices with me. A Fisher-Price baby toy and an AED. I asked for a volunteer, a sixth grade boy. I asked him to turn them on. He took the toy first. He took a look. He pushed this button. This just spins around. It doesn't do anything. Then he realized that you got to slide this thing to the, to the left to turn it on. He then took the AED device, looked at it, and pushed the green button, Training scenario which turns it on. Two. And the instructions that I just shared with you followed. So, as you can see, these devices are made for the public. They're made for people of all ages, and they're important for us to have around. So thank you for introducing this uh, amendment that will ensure that these easy, effective, and relatively inexpensive tools are available for the adults and kids in our communities. Your actions will save lives. I'm sorry for interrupting, and we usually go straight through the panel, but I, ha I have to ask, how much is that device you just held up? You're not talking about not the toy, the, right? Not, not the toy, no, the AD device. So um, AD devices range uh, in price. Uh, they start around $1,000 and can go up to over $2,000. It depends on the, on the make and model. Um, but they all deliver a shock, and they can all potentially save someone's life. Okay, pretty good. Thank you very much. Thank you. State your name for the record, please, and you may proceed with your testimony. Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin Abella. I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, good morning. Um, as I stated, I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, where I also am a practicing emergency uh, physician in the emergency department at HUP. Uh, where I've worked for the past 15 years, often in collaboration with the excellent leaders of the Philadelphia Fire Department, including Commissioner Thiel and others. Uh, relevant to our discussion today, I'm an expert in cardiac arrest, CPR, and related topics, having conducted numerous research projects in these areas over the years. I've also served on the international expert panel that author authors the CPR guidelines that are used around the world. I'm here to express my strong support for this bill, proposed by the council regarding the placement of AEDs and other emergency care equipment in city buildings. I applaud council members Heenan, Green, and Squilla for bringing the bill before this body for your consideration, as it has enormous potential to save lives in our city and provides an important step forward for emergency preparedness and cardiovascular health. Now, my goal as the physician in this group is to provide some of the science and background, uh, so I'm gonna now go through a little bit of the uh, uh, medicine behind this whole concept. Sudden cardiac arrest occurs when the heart suddenly stops beating, causing a victim to collapse and lose consciousness without warning. Sudden cardiac arrest occurs without symptoms and requires an immediate response from bystanders if the victim is to have a chance of survival. For every minute, of untreated cardiac arrest, survival falls by approximately 10%. Uh, if no action is taken within 10 minutes of collapse, the chance of survival is less than 5%. While most people do know to call 911 if they see someone collapse, this is a necessary but not sufficient step, since activation and arrival of emergency medical services can take time, often longer than five minutes. And during this time, the lack of bystander actions can seal a victim's fate. In Philadelphia, over 1,000 people suffer cardiac arrest each year, and best estimates are that less than 200 survive to reunite with family and loved ones after hospitalization. This means there are at least 800 deaths from cardiac arrest each year in our city, either in the pre-hospital setting or in emergency departments around our city. It is important to note that cardiac arrest strikes women and men in their 50s and 60s who are often in good health, working, participating in family activities, and so forth. Death from cardiac arrest, therefore, has a large negative impact on Philadelphia families, Philadelphia workplaces, and in Philadelphia communities. Extensive clinical research has shown that AEDs can make a huge impact on cardiac arrest outcomes, doubling survival in many studies. 
Other research has shown that communities that have implemented broad AED deployment demonstrate significant gains in survival. AEDs are designed to be used by anyone, including the lay public, as our former demonstration showed so nicely. They're also designed with safety in mind. It's nearly impossible for an AED to deliver a shock to someone accidentally or to someone who is not actually in cardiac arrest. Many of the people who die from cardiac arrest do so because AEDs were not immediately available to provide life-saving shocks. Work from our team at Penn has shown that Philadelphia has a low penetration of AEDs. That is, many buildings do not have AEDs installed in lobby areas or other public spaces. However, public spaces that do have AEDs available, such as 30th Street Station, Philadelphia Airport, and such, have seen success stories of patients saved from cardiac arrest and tragedy averted by Good Samaritan citizens who put them to use. I have personally cared for a number of cardiac arrest victims who have been saved by public AEDs. They are tremendously grateful to be alive and would tell you that AEDs are a big part of why they're here today. Victims such as police officer Anthony Radico, engineer Zach Conrad, or minister Brenda Halliburton, who are all saved by public AEDs, have presented their stories in various media and gave me permission to mention them here today. So I believe we should come together as a city and stand for health and safety of our citizens. We should enable more families to bring loved ones home despite suffering cardiac arrest. I believe this bill will save many lives in our city and serve as a shining example of the care and support that our communities embody. And in closing, I also um, would like to respond to some of the discussion around an ordinance versus directive. Um, uh, from my perspective, having worked with many city facilities and many other uh, organizations around our communities, um, I see a lot of variability of implementation. And one of the reasons I believe this ordinance is important is because I think uniformity and consistency and ensconcing it into law is the best way to ensure that everyone has equal access. When things are left to uh, local discretion, and I'm not speaking for city facilities per se, but in general what I've seen is there's a wide range in practice, a wide range in implementation and training, and this bill I think will go a great step forward towards making this more uniform and making our city more safe. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, my name is uh, Marcus Owens. I'm from the Danny E. Rump II Foundation. Uh, my nephew Danny was one of two young men that collapsed and uh, died at the Mallory Rec Center in 05. Uh, previous young man by the name of Arion Keenhill had passed, uh, had dropped and died uh, a few years prior to him. Uh, so over the last 14 years, uh, the, the Rump Foundation has been working diligently in Philadelphia and bringing awareness to sudden crack arrests. Uh, providing CPR classes in our uh, local rec centers. Uh, we were uh, instrumental in helping getting the defibrillators put into our rec centers, which is a, a great thing. And so to hear that the city is looking to put them in all facilities, it is, it's amazing. Uh, and we're very uh, happy to hear that the city is willing to go to the next level, take the city up to the next level in safety. Um, this, I believe, will take the city of Philadelphia and put them in the realms of other cities who are already uh, ahead of this uh, cause, like Seattle. And so to, to hear that uh, public service, we were, we we're going to take that more serious and add these AEDs into other facilities and buildings. My next, my next thing would just ask, ask you that if you, we would just improve on the machines that we have. We have newer machines now that speak uh, double language, two languages, Spanish and, Eng and English. We have, uh, in our city, we have a large diversity of, of people in our city, and especially around our rec centers, where you can have a machine in our, one of our Latino areas where they can go get that machine and hit the button and it'll speak Spanish to them. So in conjunction with adding, getting the machines into the building, I would just ask you here today that you would look into getting you know, the better ones that can give you the two languages because we are diverse in our city and we want to make sure that all of our, our citizens here or be able and be comfortable to grab the machine and use it as well. And I just thank you for having me here today um, to testify that this is a great cause and a great uh, bill to pass and I'm praying that we can get it done. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rachel Moyer and I come to you from the Poconos. Philadelphia plays a big role in my life because the frequency we have to come down from the mountains for all the th great things that you offer. Um, in the year 2000, my son 
was playing basketball in a $70 million school. It was the first varsity game that he um, was playing in, but they did not have an AED. So the year was 2000. And I was a school teacher. I had been a school teacher at that time for about 15 years, and I could take everybody's kid out for a fire drill, but I did not know how to do CPR on my son, nor did I know what an AED was. Um, when Greg collapsed, there was a doctor and two nurses that were there at the auditorium in the school, and no one performed CPR on my son. And I, that lives in me every day that I did not know what to do. Now it's my goal, since I couldn't save my son, to make sure I go out and I do everything I can to help s save someone else's. Um, I did not know what an AED was in the year in 2000. Uh, after the ER nurse told me what it was and that it could have made a difference because my son had no signs or symptoms, he had three sports physicals a year, but no one knew that Greg was gonna collapse from cardiac, sign, uh, cardiac arrest. Um, pa Pennsylvania passed the first law in the United States that reduced the cost of an AED from about $3,400 to less than $1,500. Um, there was competition and for first time there was um, bids that had to be in and the cost came down. So when people would tell me before we can't afford an AED at $3,400, don't tell me that you can't afford something that's less than $1,500 and especially when you're gonna buy them in bulk. Um, when I was on my way to Philadelphia, in um, 2001 to meet with Dr. Vicki Vetter at um, CHOP and Marcus Owens was, and Darren, Darren Sudman until years later, it was a few years later, that we all have managed to coordinate efforts to try and make Philadelphia safe. But on my way to Philadelphia, I saw a Comcast billboard that said, if you need help, call the Philadelphia Philly trial lawyers. So I thought, bingo. That's what I'm gonna do, and I called them. So when this law was passed in 2001 that gave affordable prices to AEDs, we, you in Philadelphia were going to get 17 AEDs for a high school. Well, there was over 100 high schools at the time, and that wasn't enough, and I called the Philly trial lawyers and they donated 125,000, so each one of your schools got an AED. It's taken us a long time. First, the middle schools got the AEDs through CHOP, and then the elementary schools got them also by different donations, and especially through CHOP. And Betty Ann Creighton, who was the director of your health and phys ed, she was responsible, saying, I'm not going to retire until there's an AED in every school in Philadelphia. And that's what happened this year. So it was a long haul, but I can say, there has been lives that have been saved, and if you read the Philly Inquirer uh, recently, you heard about the kid that collapsed at Ben Franklin, and if it wasn't for the AED, everybody says, the doctors say, that he would not have made it. So a response time, and, and it was awesome. Um, so it's, it's important to you, that, to me, and to you as well, that you have a response plan that you also developed that the American Heart Association has done. It's been very effective with the Philadelphia schools about training their teachers and their staff. It's not that hard, and you basically get a certificate of completion. It's not a certification. It's a certificate which can you can train your supervisors and your staff in the city to also train their staff as well. As well, Four months ago, I gave testimony in Middle Smithfield Township, which is a small uh, township in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, um, to, so that they could have an ordinance passed that would require ADs in all of their um, building, uh, buildings of new construction. That happened recently, that was the first ordinance in Pennsylvania that's been passed for any of our townships, cities, or whatever. Two years ago, I gave testimony in Honolulu that um, they did, provided, the government, city government provided AEDs for all of the city buildings. It's been successful, and after two years, there's definitely um, 
ADs in all city and public buildings and on their different, in their different parks. Um, I think that the state of Pennsylvania will certainly mark its place in history if it passes legislation that is going to save lives and protect people. There isn't anything worse in the world than losing a child. And if this council can actually say, we have the ability to make a change, just like we in, it was actually a lot of people don't know, in 1958, the, uh, a Catholic school in, in Chicago, where 92 students died and three teachers, they passed the next year, an ordinance was passed throughout the country that said, okay, we have to have fire extinguishers and we have to have fire alarms and we have to have fire drills. The last kid that died in a fire was 1958. There hasn't been anybody that's died in their school since then. So if you're saying to the, to the city of Philadelphia that we're gonna protect our citizens by getting AEDs in every, every building and we're gonna train people on how to use it, the number of deaths each year can change significantly. 50,000 lives can be changed a year if all the other communities, states would do such a thing. So I'm, I'm, I feel, as I said to Councilman um, Hannah, that I think this is, you're making a profound statement. So this has not happened in any other city. There's probably four cities in the United States that have done it, none of them are as big as Philadelphia. So I can't thank you enough, and then you've been number one recently um, for your sports that you had down here, then I'm hoping that you'll be number one in the country once again by making the city of brotherly love a very safe place. Okay, the AED, so this is what I wanted to tell you, what I want, on Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, um, the sheriff's department does not, your city sheriff's department does not have AEDs. So I had uh, the honor of me meeting the um, assistant sheriff, uh, Paris Washington, and I said, I can't believe you guys don't have AEDs. And he says, I can't believe it either. And so I said, well, we're gonna give one to you. And this is not it. This is the one I'm giving to the city council because I want you, I have the opportunity to meet Sandra Danner and she is with the risk management division and she took the time to talk to us about AEDs and their locations and there's not enough signs and there should be a sign on every door um, and when I go, I always go into places and I say, where's your AED? And they look at me like I have two heads, like what's an AED? It's getting better but it's not where it should be. This AED will tell you that it's ready when it has a green light. If the green light is not on, it will beep and tell you there's an issue. All you have to do is open it up and it'll tell you what the issue is. This machine will talk Stay to you calm. through. About fourth Follow grade education. Make sure 911 is called now. Mm. Begin by exposing patient's bare chest. Remove or cut clothing if needed. When patient's chest is bare, remove the white square package from lid of AED. Comience por descubrir el pecho del paciente. Quite or corte la ropa si es necesario. Begin by exposing patient's bare chest. So if you have... Remove or cut clothing if needed. This is it. You open it up. You put them on either side. Here, here, bare, up here, or down here. Remove the white square package so, from lid of AED. But I want you to... I wanted the Greg... In honor of my son, I wanted to do something today, say, I'm really serious, I will help you guys. And as the people that are here today, all of them, we will do anything that we can to make Philadelphia the first heart safe city in the United States. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your testimony. First and foremost, you know, we are deeply saddened and sorry for your loss of your son and Marcus to you know, your nephew. And um, it is our hope, I think we do all share the same goals, you know, uh, whether it's risk management, public property, sheriff's department, uh, not sure if every, you know, those departments have an actual AED in it or, or, they, or they do not, uh, but we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there and we're gonna make you proud. And, um, you know, it is the way we collaborate with the 
departments and agencies from a legislative body and a uh, administration, you know, we'll work things out. All right, but we're go we're going to get there, and we're going to ensure that things are uh, fully implemented uh, for the safety of uh, everybody, including our visitors, not just you know the people who live here and work here, uh, but those who come in and uh, want to enjoy our city and everything it has to offer. You know, we're we're an urban we're an urban city, all right, that has great utilized outdoor spaces. All right, we want to make sure that everybody uses them. Uh, so thank you for being here. Chair recognizes Council Mano. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, let me first start by thanking the Chairman. Uh, this was truly enlightening and, uh, you know, wow, I'm, I'm just uh, really uh, eye-opening. And, uh, you know, you have taken your profession and your personal loss and turned it into a mission that is saving lives, and I really want to thank you for that. My father had a heart attack back in 76. He survived. You know, my sister fortunately was there, found him slumped over, uh, called the 911. They came in time, and he lived another 30 years. And so he was 56 when he had a heart attack. It's always been on my mind, 56, folks who are 56, healthy, but I never thought about an AED. And I go to tons of events, I, you know, with my veterans, I go to veterans meetings, and there's a lot of uh, fellas who uh, served in Vietnam, they're right at that age. I think about my church, we have doctors in the church, we have no AED there. Uh, they would know how to do it, we just don't have one. Um, and, and so this is really eye-opening, you know, $1,200, $1,000, $1,500, certainly something we would love to have on hand. Um, I'm even thinking about just buying one and taking it with me where I go, <laughs> at least have it in my car. We go to outdoor <laughs> events, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, folks out there and it's just not, not, something that has not crossed my mind, but I connect it right away with, you know, what happened with my dad. And so I thank you for bringing this to our attention um, and, and to our, our, our chair for, for having this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I have two questions uh, for a, a few folks. So one I want to ask, uh, Doctor, can you, you, you mentioned uh, sudden cardiac arrest. Right? Can you, and then you described it right? I mean, very specifically. Could you? Describe the difference between a cardiac arrest and somebody who's having a heart attack. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a very important one, and it's one I get asked often. Um, so they are completely different entities. Uh, a heart attack is when a artery to the heart is blocked, and um, an acute blockage to that artery causes a loss of blood flow to the muscle beyond that pipe, that, that artery. So it's the death of a small piece of heart muscle Generally, people with heart attack have pain or shortness of breath. They may pass out. They may have sweatiness. But 95% of the time, they do not have cardiac arrest. That is to say, they have pain and symptoms, and it can lead to problems. Untreated can lead to cardiac arrest, but most of the time it does not. In the year 2019, the vast majority of cardiac heart attack victims do well and survive to hospital discharge. They never need CPR. They never need an AD. Contrast that with cardiac arrest, where the heart suddenly stops beating. Now, it can stop beating from a heart attack or from other causes. So, for example, a blood clot to the lungs can cause cardiac arrest. Sometimes a blood chemical imbalance can do it. Certain medications can increase the risk of arrhythmia. Um, a, a very uh, fateful and tragic event, sometimes um, in youth sporting events, a strike to the chest from a baseball can put someone into a heart arrhythmia and lead to cardiac arrest um, in a perfectly healthy person. So they're separate diseases, heart attack and cardiac arrest. And, and the reason why I'm grateful for your question, and it's a very important point to underscore, is it speaks to some of the public messaging around this. We often lead training sessions where people say, I don't understand why we need to know CPR. My brother had a heart attack. He never needed CPR. And, and so it speaks to a very important messaging issue. So, so those are the diseases that we're speaking of. And AEDs are specifically for cardiac arrest not for heart attacks. Now, if someone were to have chest pain or symptoms of a heart attack, I would recommend having an AED nearby um, and, and perhaps even applying it as a precautionary measure or at least having it close at hand because one can lead to the other if untreated. So, in either case, call 911 first. 
Absolutely. <laughs> and, then, and then respond. Absolutely. Great. Well, th thank you for it. Because I, I think it's important that people understand the difference, right, with the sudden cardiac arrest. Somebody needs to act now. Somebody needs to respond. And if there's nothing within three or an AED, with, and if you're in public space where there's an AED within three, four minutes, those numbers are absolutely staggering on, on, on the outcomes as uh, the, the longer the response, the, uh, the survival rate lessens, you know, 10%, 10%, and it's just, it's, it's just staggering. And, and we have it in our kind of uh, world at this point where we can actually take action, right, to minimize that as much as they can with a citywide policy that makes sense for, for everybody equally and, fa and fairly. Um, I have a question for Darren regarding the AED devices. It's interesting that, that Rachel was talking about, in, you know, a few years ago in 2000 where the devices were $3,500 and, you know, and I guess some can still be, you know, very expensive in, in, in its most technical and elaborate, you know, uh, um, and, and devices, uh, but if we, how often does the technology change and makes it more affordable for institutions and organizations? So, I mean, it is a very, very user-friendly device. Um, I mean, TVs, right, and Blu-rays came out and flat screens, I mean, they were you know, very expensive and now you can go to Best Buy or you can go to Amazon and you get them in there. It, they're a fraction of the price. Here, they're a, uh, a third of the price when, you know, from, from just your, your experience, Rachel, from 2000 to now. And, you know, what is the battery life? And, and the ones that we, you know, facilities may have, do batteries change? You know, our cell phone batteries change all the time. Do batteries change? Do the technologies change? And, or, you know, how are they a lot more user friendly? So I think all AEDs have two things in common. They're easy to use, they're designed to be easy to use, and um, they all deliver a life-saving shock. After that, you, um, you can assess what, what's the cost of battery and pad replacement. Um, some are cheaper than others. Uh, as you just saw, this device is bilingual. Uh, the device I showed you is not. Uh, there are also newer devices in terms of new technology that don't advise you to deliver a shock and push that blinking uh, lightning bolt button. It'll just say, uh, shock advised, please stand clear, we're gonna deliver a shock. So it's an automatic shock. So um, those are things to consider that will increase the price uh, as, you, as you make your decision and shop. So when, you know, and I'll, and I'll end on this question with you. Um, you know, we may have devices, right, or you know, places of business, if, if not the city of Philadelphia, may have devices. If they're not new purchased, you know, how, what are the life of the batteries? So we may have devices with the battery shelf life may be expired and need to change, which means we, we probably will need a new device. Is that a, a fair, fair statement? I, Ra Rachel can comment on this too, but I think uh, if you looked at all six five or six manufacturers, the average battery pad life is anywhere from three to five years, depending on the make and model. Okay. And, um, and I'd also just like to point out uh, to all of you that I invited Ryan Wizoff here as well. His, uh, his son actually survived sudden cardiac arrest, so he has a perspective that none of us have if you have any questions about that. Okay, and I think it's wonderful. Councilman Jones, we, you know, we, you know, sponsored a bill that passed unanimously to uh, use new smoke detectors with a battery, with a 10 year battery life. And, and it just became effective. So there's a new directive given by policy ordinance, right? Where it requires new, it's a law, it requires new installation of uh, any, any smoke detectors to have a 10 year battery life. And, and, and I think that just goes to case in point why it is important to uh, to mention that, right? As we 
are also trying to save a life, and I think the battery life and user friendly, you know, type of thing is minimal, de minimis when it comes to uh, what we do as a city. Uh, anybody else here have any questions? For, yes. Could I make a comment? Um, the, you asked about the technology, and I think that's really important because I think most of us do not have our first cell phone that we got. Most of us don't have our first car. So technology, there are changes. Many of the ADs that are on the market, and I visited every manufacturer, and I said, so, show me what you have. Tell me how it saves a life. And um, this is the newest... FDA approved AED on the market. I love it for a number of reasons because the fact my son was six foot three, um, about 210 pounds, and um, he was only 15 years old. And so I want a device that is going to customize the energy to the person that's collapsed, whether it's the um, 100 pounder that you have or whether it's 300 pounds. When you put the electrodes on the victim with this device, it checks the impedance level. It says, okay, where should we shock? And it shocks anywhere between 94 and 354 joules. The other devices that are on the market, and this is something where, where I don't think it happens to you guys as much, but for me, it has one size fits all, and that's not true with me. It, they're, all of them are different, and that's what you need to know. So when you are um, have a certain device, it will shock at only 150 joules, no matter what you weigh. What you weigh, it that's the only thing. Then there's another one that's 120, 150, then 200. It takes you six minutes. You do CPR at 1 120. You do two more minutes of CPR at 150, and two more minutes. It takes you six minutes to get the amount of, the highest amount of the joules that they give. Another one I think goes up to 350, but it's another one that takes six minutes. I want a device that you put on your victim and it customizes to know where to shock, that you're not standing there for six minutes determining whether it's the last shock that's going to work. So about bringing in the new devices, the, when the places I've been around the city, yes, you have a lot of old AEDs. Even the fire companies have been generous about giving the, the AEDs to different city um, facilities. But I think you phase them out, and the electrodes, you, it, it, this one you change every two years because it tests itself every single day to make sure it has all of the components it needs to work, the battery is okay, the electrodes are okay, the internal mechanism. That's why this green light tells, now the other ones, they check themselves once a week, you know, and they'll have a light and you can interfere with the testing pattern by picking out their electrodes and they don't indicate that the machine is not ready for use. And when the University of Hawaii, when I was just at their fantastic looking swimming pool and I saw this one device and I went over, they had pediatric pads in it. And I said, no, this is not gonna work. This is a facility for adults and, and the pads are already open. So this machine will tech, check every single day to make sure it's gonna work. It has a $10 million indemnification, come, uh, indemnification policy on it. And I sound like I should work with them, and I want you to know they have offered me a job. But I wanted, wanted to know that what I offer to people and what we gave away, and um, I never leave home without my AED in the car. So just for you all to know, it doesn't like anything below 32 degrees or above 105 degrees. Other than that, I'd like to carry it with me. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, thank you all for your testimony uh, for here today. We're going to conclude, unless there's anyone else that wishes to speak on 190099. All right, that being none, we... I would, I'd just like to say a couple words if possible. Sure, sure. Come, come up, state your name for the record. I'll be brief. Um, Darren Sudman invited me. My name is Ryan Wizov. Um, my son had a uh, sudden cardiac arrest and near fatal drowning in 2015. Uh, well, first, I want to commend the program that you guys are looking to install within Philadelphia. I applaud it. Um, I love the idea of one responsible entity to oversee for all. Um, I would, however, challenge you to keep pushing, keep pushing until all areas are protected. That would include the parks outside, 
that are not necessarily in an enclosed building, but rather are outdoors. Um, it's been almost four years that I've been affected and involved. Uh, the biggest takeaway that I have comes from a story from an EMT that shared with me that um, typically when he gets a call saying that there's been a cardiac arrest, he, f he feels that it's more of a cleanup duty than anything. When he is told that there is a, an AED on site, he gets excited. He knows that he has a fighting chance. He knows that there's an opportunity to save a life. Lask, um, what is meant by uh, risk management? To me, the, the risk it, to me is priceless. If the goal is to be on the same, the same page and to save lives, conversations that include risk management should quite frankly never even come up. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're deeply sorry for your loss. Uh, this will end our he this will end our committee hearing, public committee hearing on public property and public works. Uh, I want to remind, for the record, that Bill Number One Nine Zero One Two Zero is being held at the chair. We will now move into our public meeting of public property, public work. Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I move that the amendment to Bill Number One Nine Zero Zero Nine Nine be approved. Second. This amendment, your bill is amended. You changed the. Yeah. It, it has been moved and second. All those in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment to bill number 190099 has been amended. Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that Bill Number 190099 as amended and Bill Number 190062 be voted out of this committee with favorable recommendation. And I move further that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of these bills at our next session of council. Second. It has been moved and properly second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Bill Number 190062 and 190099. As amended, be reported out of the committee with a favorable recommendation with the rule suspension as to be heard at the next council session. And this will conclude our public meeting and hearing on public property, public works. Thank you for all those who participate.